We should be good. <laughs> All right, Lawrence, go ahead. Good morning, everybody. Friday, March 25th, 2022. The slaughterhouse of failure is not in our destinies. We shall persevere until we succeed. Ogmandina modified. So today we're going to talk a little bit about modeling leadership. What sort of leadership? What sort of leader are you? And how do you want to lead? What sort of results do you want? from your team how do you want the leaders to form how do you want the leaders to be how good a leader are you so these are just some of the questions dan will then picked out something from albert schweitzer who was a missionary in africa in the congo and he spent most of his he was actually a doctor and he spent most of his life down there in uh, in the congo so um, he has something to say, and Dan, you can go ahead and you'll be more eloquent than I am in quoting that. Yeah, Albert Schweitzer had a great quote that we kind of based this, this week's talk on, and that is that the example is not the main thing influence, in influencing others, it is the only thing. And so, you know, we really need to think about how we're leading, how we're moving forward, how we're um, directing our teams, working together with our teams, and and how we're not only how we're leading, but how we're viewed as leaders, um, because people ultimately emulate what they see modeled. Right. And so how, however we're leading, however we choose to lead and however we coach is how you know, people on our team are going to tend to to you know, naturally emulate those behaviors. So, you know, part of creating an appealing climate in a, on a team is to grow potential leader and, and growing potential leaders is modeling leadership. And so we really need to model the leadership that we wanna see within our organizations, model that leadership that we want to uh, other people within our organizations to, to emulate um, and, and move forward from there. Yeah, so, you know, we always talk about um, walking the talk. And it's about the leadership that we have. We should be leading ourselves first. That's where leadership starts, with how we think, how we act, how we behave. Um, this is where leadership actually starts, where people then see and judge, because people judge, um, how we are. And they can either emulate us in a good way or avoid us if we're not doing the right things. So, you know, on this leadership thing i just thought about something <clears throat> when i went to um you know nigeria i uh, took over a company and it was back in the late 60s probably many people weren't even born then but anyway um and i went there and the, the culture there was you know do your job shut up and do what you're told otherwise you get fired and I saw that and I saw people were working in a sort of a have to do basis. And I looked at that and I found one and then another. And I, I was always trying to be complimentary about people. Wow, what a good job. You did great. Wow, what's your name? Well, oh, what's your family? Oh, yeah, you got kids. What are their names? How old are they? And I just took an interest. But I was also very um, attentive to any little effort that people made more. And I noticed it. And I was always trying to, you know, be, be nice about what I saw. And honestly, in the first six months, there were dramatic changes, dramatic. Our output increased, our, our um, success really, really improved. And I realized that even the guy who cleans the floor, the person who makes the coffee, whoever it is, acknowledge them, be, be attentive, be, be, be kind, be empathetic. Empathy is a word which a lot of people need to, we all need to really develop. So anyway, I just want to say that even small, small things that we notice in other people, if we can just exalt that it, it's a big help to that individual and i think that's one of the things of leadership 
And you, and you probably learned that that style of leadership from somebody by viewing somebody in your life, Lawrence. And so, you know, as leaders, we are primarily a follower of great principles and other great leaders. You know, we've been taught these things, whether we realize it or not, whether we recognize it or not, we've been taught our leadership skills by watching others. And when I was in medical device sales, I was really, really fortunate to work for a distributor. Um, his name was Mark Randall. And he was, uh, you know, genuinely just a very, very good person. He, he treated everybody equally. It didn't matter where they were at. If they were the lowest per person on the totem pole or, or the highest person on the totem pole, he, he paid people well uh, for the job that they were doing almost to a fault because he really, in my opinion, he drove $120 million territory or a distributorship um, kind of into the ground because he was paying, overpaying people. So he, he saw the value in people and he was, he was friendly with everyone, you know, very, very modest. He drove a, you know, like a very low model Volvo um, sedan. Um, he was never flashy. Um, everybody loved him. He was just a genuinely really, really good person. And, and that's one of the people that, that I attest to my, to my leadership style today or my coaching style. Um, the other person is my, is my um, ex-brother-in-law. He's an orthopedic surgeon, fantastic human, uh, very, very generous to people, treated people from all walks of life very, very well, whether he knew them or he didn't, always trying to put a smile on people's faces, um, you know, had awesome bedside manner, you know, probably one of the most respected orthopedic surgeons in our, in our area, um, as far as bedside manner and how much people liked him and and, you know, that all comes back to how he treats, treats people around him. You know, he never treated people like he was better than them. He never, you know, just because he was successful or had more money, you know, treated people the same. So, you know, that's kind of what I try to model my, my, um, my life after personally, professionally. And, and I learned those attributes from others around me. And that's, that's kind of how we get our leadership and our coaching style. So, you know, one of the other things that both of these gentlemen did was they would never ask more of others than they were willing to ask of themselves, right? They were always the first one to jump in. It didn't matter how small the task was or how large the task was. They were always willing to jump in and, and, and do what needed to be done to, to reach our goals. Um, and so those are two really, really good app attributes that, that I've tried to follow um, throughout my life. And I'm sure, you know, everybody on this call probably has a similar story of somebody in their life, whether it was personally or professionally, um, that really um, has led them in a direction in their life um, to where they are today. You know, people, people really emulate what they see modeled. Um, positive modeling equals positive responses from people. Negative modeling becomes a negative response from people. And so, you know, we really want to do what's right for, for us and those around us, those within our organization, making sure that we're, we're leading everybody in a, in a positive, uh, impactful manner. And, um, you know, that's what we try to do on these, not only on these fr Friday calls, but we try to do that within our own organizations in this business. You know, Dan, you remember, you've, you've said a couple of things that really resonated. This thing about bedside manner, you know, you could be a genius and know everything about everything in terms of, of medicine, for example. But if you don't impart that information in a humane, empathetic way, you won't have the same receptivity as someone who doesn't know as much, but that can connect with the person. So the connection, I think, is huge. And, and the bedside manner, how you, how, you do, how you talk to the people and so on, I think that's huge. Even We've always talked about that. Even when I was a kid, they used to say, Dr. So-and-so is an expert, but he's, a, you know, he's, a, he's a, an ogre. But he knew a lot. So you're right, bedside manner. The other thing, and what you were saying about Albert Schweitzer, um, he said, example is not the main thing. It's the only thing. And I remember um, two things. My dad was, my dad had a big company and so on. And, and I remember he used to, at first, he would, with his managers, he would say, you know, this is what I want done. And some people wouldn't take notes. And some people would. And he used to get furious with the people who didn't take notes. And I remember saying to him, Dad, you know, 
or an understanding that some people are visual, some people are audio, some people are kinesthetic. So the showing something by example is actually both audio and um, visual. And this is something where we can, we can actually um, have more impact where we, where we actually show by example not only just say things by example, but we show them. Um, so, and, and the other thing, last thing I want to say to was again, in Nigeria, for example, that's where, where I started learning a lot of things because I started doing everything myself. I went there as a young guy, as a young manager, and, and I wanted to be able to prove that I was going to be really good. And I started doing everything. And even when you mentioned the janitor thing, the sweeping and so on, I remember going in there and the, 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 the guy who was actually cleaning the, the offices and so on, he, was, he wasn't really enthusiastic, obviously, who can be enthusiastic. And I took, took the broom from him and I, and I started to talk with him a little bit. And while I was talking to him, I said, sit down, watch. And I started doing what I wanted it to be done, how I wanted it to be done. And he was astounded that, that, that I would actually pick up the broom and do these things. And it was just to show him that this is how I want it done. And you're a really nice guy. Just learn how to do it in this way because it will be, and whatever you do, be good at it. And I, that was a lesson I told him. And he used to joke about that afterwards, you know, when he'd see me, I'm good at what I do. And I said, exactly. He, he, it's all, it's, that's what it's about. Yeah, you know, it, it, and a lot of that starts with personal growth, you know. It doesn't really matter, uh, you know, what our personality is, how we go about, um, you know, teaching people, coaching people, leadership. You know, there's no real good substitute for personal growth. Um, we really can't model what we don't possess. And so we need to learn from these other folks in our lives, um, these leadership skills, these personal, personal um, growth skills, coaching skills. And there's a great quote from... Um, from Lee Iacocca, um, who basically said that, um, shoot, I had it written down here somewhere. Um, where did I have that? Oh, um, he suggests that the speed of the, that the speed of the ball is the speed of the team, right? And so, you know, a leader can't demand of others what he does not demand of himself. And one of the things that I talk about with people when they join our team is, you know, how fast do you want to move? You know, if you want to move at, at a snail's pace, we'll move at a snail's pace. If you want to move quickly, we'll move quickly. I'm going to match your energy, no matter what that energy is. And the more energy you give me, I'm going to give you. Um, and so, you, you know, leaders become their goals. Leaders set the tone uh, for the rest of the people on the team and in the organization. And then, you know, we just expect people to follow those goals and, and follow what we're doing to lead and teach others uh, down the line, especially in this business. You know, one of the other interesting things is that, you know, we really can't lead effectively more than four or five, six people. And so that's kind of how our business is set up, you know, to hit Ruby, um, you need four people in your downline to hit Team Elite, you need six people in your downline, you know, because we can't really can't manage more than that amount of people. And so we need to be able to, to lead four or six people and teach them, coach them to do what we've done to be successful and then have them coach five or six people below them right? It's just duplication um, in that leadership and in that coaching. Um, so Lawrence, did you want to, you know, I'm sure there's some people on this call that have some great stories of, of people who have coached them and, and leadership styles that they've learned from other people. You know, one of, the, one of the people that I would be fascinated to hear from is Chuck Ray as a principal, uh, a high school principal, and then as a wrestling coach. And I'm sure he's He's influenced, you know, hundreds, if not thousands or tens of thousands of kids uh, during his career. And, and that's awesome. But who ultimately, Chuck, if you don't mind coming off of, um, of mute, tell us a little bit about who you are and, and tell us who influenced you. Because, I, you know, your personality is fantastic. You know, I've seen you work booths at uh, trade shows. You know, you do a phenomenal job with that. Um, every time we talk, I, you know, it's a fascinating conversation. I really enjoy talking to you. And, you know, so you learn these leadership skills and these coaching skills from somebody. Do, do you have a story about that? 
Well, I, you know, I, I guess I was fortunate in my life. I had, um, I had a whole bunch of people that uh, influenced me, starting with my mom, um, who was as nice to everybody as anybody would be. She you know, didn't have a bad thing to say about any person. So I've tried to model that. And then I had, um, I had a high school coach, wrestling coach that um, was a very unassuming guy. And I, then I later found out he was a national champion in, in college, but he didn't go around telling people that he was a national champion. Um, he didn't wrestle in high school, but went to college and wound up being a national champion. Now think about oh. that for just a minute. Yeah, <laughs> so the dedication uh, that that took. And then my college wrestling coach uh, was also, um, you know, a big influence and just recently passed away from COVID actually, but um, he just uh, was a class act. Um, and we look back and we say, gosh, she was pretty young when he coached us, um, you know, but we never, we never thought of him that way. He was, he was the pro, he was the expert. He was the guy you listened to and had all the answers. Um, so, um, and then uh, one of my principals um, was just a, a very calm guy, always, um, always very kind to other people. Uh, so I've, I've been very blessed. And one of the things I tried to do was one of my, one of my parts was I always wanted to tell kids what I thought their parents would want them to hear. And hopefully uh, that would come back to me when people dealt with my kids. So uh, pay it forward kind of type, you know, thing. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, you know, and through that, you know, those leadership things that you learn from your coaches and your mother and, you know, personality traits and things like that. I'm sure you've had kids come back to you at some point and say that you were a big influence in their lives, right? And then they probably emulated some of the things that they learned from you, right? And so it's, you know, it's all about this, this circle that happens with leadership and coaching where we're, we're really, you know, learning from others in our lives and we're teaching that down the line. Yeah, I, I had uh, one student in particular, uh, we were in California and I touched base with him, he lives out there now, but uh, his dad had been, been a builder, um, a developer. And so he moved to Florida and uh, started his, his, the son who wrestled for me, moved down there and started his own company. And he retired at the age of 40 um, because he made so much money uh, building all these things. But um, his partner was another kid that wrestled uh, for me, was in his same class. And so he said, you know, he says a lot of what happened with me was was attributed to what you did with the wrestling team. He said uh, we would get in a tough situation and uh, we would look at each other and say, if we could make it through check race practices, we can do anything. <laughs> you know, I go, yeah, you're right. So, you know, I was hard on him, but, you know, it, it paid off for a lot of them in the, in the long run. I'm, it is one of the things I'm very uh, happy about, proud of. Yeah. For those of you who have never been in a, in a wrestling room, it's probably <laughs> one of the most difficult sports to train for. I mean, these coaches literally try to kill you um, by just, you know, increasing your co cardiovascular. Um, you know, they they put you in a hot room and have you wrestle. You've got clothes on trying to cut weight, you know, sweatsuits. And, you know, it's just a very, very difficult sport to train for. Um, because you need to go out, be able to go out there and wrestle for six or seven minutes as hard as you possibly can one-on-one -on -one with another person. It's just a very, very grueling sport um, and, and, you know, testament to Chuck for, for teaching kids for all those years. And I'm sure a lot of them really came out of the wrestling room. Um, really, really awesome individuals. So thanks for sharing that, Chuck. Really appreciate it. So Chuck, let me ask you, how did you, how did you get a person to go from being a good wrestler to being a great wrestler? What, what, what motivation did you give him? How did you motivate the person? I think it was fear. No, I'm <laughs> <laughs> no I, always, I always told him that, um, you know, I had to push them beyond where they thought they could go because you can always, it's like riding a horse. A horse will gallop so fast, but if you, um, you know, like in a horse race, if they give it the whip or they hit the spurs, the horse is going to run faster. So as a coach, that's part of your job is to push them a little bit farther 
uh, to make them go farther than they think they can go. That when they, way when they get in a tough situation, they can always go a little bit farther. And I would ask them, I would tell them, the only thing I can guarantee is that you'll be in shape. I can't guarantee that you'll know the moves or use them at the right times. So if you're out of shape on the mat, I guess I have to make practices harder. And they shuddered at that thought. <laughs> but so in a match, I would just ask them, are you tired? They didn't want to say yes. Yep. <laughs> yeah. and wrestling wrestling's one of those sports where it, you know accountability comes into play ah, exactly. right because it's one of the truest probably the truest forms of sport most pure forms of a sport because it's one-on-one -on -one, you're out on a mat the lights are on the, the center of the mat everybody's looking at you it's not even though it's a team sport it's still an individual sport right and so if you go out there if you're not trained properly or if you didn't learn the move properly or you don't have the the um the fortitude or the energy to finish that match you know more than likely if the other person does you're going to lose right and so you want to go out there as prepared as possible because you're the only person that's going to be embarrassed because you're the only one that's out there on the mat you're out there alone on the mat with another person you know and it's a lot you know it's a lot like this business this business a lot of days you're out there alone you know you've got a team behind you but you are out there alone doing what you need to do and what you've been taught by, you know, the leaders in this organization on what to do. And if you go out and you flounder, you know, at some point you need to take responsibility for what you're doing. We can't do everything for you. We can, we can give you the tools. Like Chuck said, we can give you the tools, but we can't guarantee that when you go out there on your own, that you're going to perform. Right. But what we can do is get you in shape to perform by getting on these Friday calls, getting on the team calls, coming out to the healthcare forum, you know, doing three-way calls. That's how we train, right? It's no different. And, you know, one of the cool things, um, I did a talk on our team call this week, is that fit, uh, success is transferable, right? It doesn't matter what you've done in life to be successful. If you've succeeded at something, you can transfer that success to anything else in life, right? Whether it be this business, whether it be your personal relationships, it doesn't matter what it is, you can transfer that success, Right. What did you do to get there? Did you put in that 10,000 hours? Uh, as Mal Malcolm Gladwell says, there's a 10,000 hour principle. Did you put in that 10,000 hours to be as good as you can possibly be? You know, did you put in that 100 hours this week or 40 hours this week? How many hours did you put in this week to be the best you could possibly be in and see the most success in this business? But on the flip side, failure is transferable also. If you're not doing those things that you need to do to be successful and you failed and failed and failed in life, and you try to carry those things onto a new, uh, to a, to a new endeavor. More than likely, you're going to fail again. So you need, you know, if you're failing at things, you need to look at why you're failing and change what you're doing, right? You know, when Chuck had wrestlers and they went out and they were a little bit too aggressive with somebody and they got flipped on their back and pinned because you know they were looking at being aggressive and not being tactful, and you know following a strategy, you know then they need to figure out what they can do differently the next time so that they don't get embarrassed so that they do win. You know, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of really, really good lessons that can be learned from, from wrestling and coaching sports. And I'm sure Chuck can attest to that. But just think about something that, that you said, that Chuck said, are you tired? Just a question. Are you tired? Think about the motivation that does the ego, the pride, you know, all of these things. So you can motivate someone by asking a question. Are you tired? The person's going to, no, no, of course not. He may be dying, but he's going to say, no, I'm going to, no, of course I'm not. So, so I think, I think this psycholo the psychology behind what we do, what leaders do, what we all are trying to do is very, 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 very important. And it's, and, and it's not just the tactical side, it's the psychological part of how we can make it work. It's the mindset of everything. That's what this is all about. Absolutely. Um, do we want to call on somebody else? Thank you, Chuck. Do we want to call you. on somebody can else? I, <clears throat> can I ask Chuck a question? Yeah, go ahead, sure. Because Lawrence is so funny, you keyed in on that question, are you tired? Because I think there's an entire book in Chuck's mind written between that question, are you tired? And the next statement was, they never wanted to tell me yes. And it, it, you know, it just reminds me of the book, Grit. You know, uh, you know, in that book, they talk about that 
the, the people that have kind of a grit inside them, a natural grit. But I think there's something there that Chuck did between well before asking them, are you tired? I'd love to hear his insights on this because, you know, when you reach a point as a coach, you're asking, are you tired? To me, it's almost asking, have you learned everything I've taught you? Have you, you know, have you uh, developed this grit that I tried to help, help install in you? Uh, but I just would love to hear his comment on it. And if there's anything he had as a technique that helped do that, it's not, it doesn't happen in one meeting with somebody. It happens over a season. And you're right, that wrestling, that wrestling uh, sport is probably one of the toughest, most uh, develops more self-character than anything. So, <clears throat> Well, I, you know, I, I just think it was being... Um honest with them about their abilities at times, um, taking them wherever they are. And, and I always, I was not a coach that said, this is what you have to do. These are not the moves you have to use because every body type is different. Every individual is different. So learn the moves, the ones that work for you, let's work on those and make them better. And, you know, that was the, the thing we talked about before on one of these calls, I said, you know, um, you you have to um, you have to take where they are and and improve upon that point um, using the skills that they have, not trying to impart your own ways. Because I wrestled different than a lot of those other kids did, but you look at the body type and you try to figure it out. But I think just being genuine with them at all times and showing that you care, even though you're really tough on them, um, I think that just that just creates that grit of I'll do anything for that coach. You said something that I think is, is powerful and that is everybody, each person is different and they're all individual and a coach. Okay. Let's put those three words together, individual, different and coach. In some ways we are, I don't want to use the word, I want to elevate it, but we are some ways a coach. Because Absolutely. we're going to every single physician who's different. One's a dentist, one's an OBGYN, one's a podiatrist. Everyone is different. And we're trying to see how we can help them improve their game. And I think this is where I've always said that we should try and be consultants. In other words, a sort of a coach where we observe what's working well somewhere else and we can help and adapt it to some place where it's not being used. So it's observing, it's watching, and it's seeing how we can help the, the, the practices improve what they're doing. But we can do that even without knowing too much about it, but simply by observing all the others that we've seen. And that's where experience comes in. And that's where we're able to, to try and, and tweak and help each different individual to, to, to maximize their efficiency. Do you agree with that? I do. I do. Each person is different and, and we can't approach it all, all the same for every person. Um, uh, and, and just even their, their um, situations are different. Uh, even if the personality is similar to your own, the situations determine a lot of things. Um, you know, for, for me, um, this is important to me, but um, you know, my, my wife spends lots of hours teaching so that I miss calls because I want to spend time with her because no, every day is, is what you're given. Tomorrow's not promised to anybody. So, uh, you know, that's, that's a focus for me at times that causes me to miss some of these meetings. But it's a choice I make, and I know that it holds me back at times. But, uh, you know, we just have to decide what's really, truly important, and then you work on that with that, imp that person. I, I had I had a softball I coached softball too and I had a softball player um, was a, a very good basketball player for us and I encouraged her to come out for softball and I kept her on the team the one year well she was probably the worst person on the team but I saw the athletic ability and what she could possibly do so there were people complaining because I kept her on the team and the next year she came back and was all league and and set the record in home runs and RBIs and everything else and I said, what happened? What? She goes, I worked all summer because you showed that you thought I could do this. And so she came back and wanted to validate my thoughts. 
That's awesome. So that brings me to my next comment. And my <laughs> next comment is that, um, so Kale Sanderson, and you knew I was going to bring this up, Chuck. <laughs> Kale Sanderson is the head coach of Penn State Wrestling. They won nine out of the last 11 national championships. Kale, I believe he went 168 and zero. He never lost a match in college um, or high school, I don't believe. Um, but he's just a phenomenal person. And so he, you know, being, think about what he needs to do to win nine out of 11 national championships out of the last 11, right? He, he needs to be coaching. He needs to be consistent. But more importantly, he needs to be picking the right people. And this goes along with what, what Chuck just said. I just saw a quote from Kale Sanderson the other day where he said, I don't, I don't recruit state champions. I recruit future national champions, right? So he's looking for people that he sees the potential to become national champions. It doesn't matter what they did in the past. You know, they could have won six state championships like Mark, Mark, Mike, Mark Hall did. Um, but, you know, that doesn't matter because past experience doesn't um, predict future results. Right. And so he's looking for people that are coachable, that fit in with the team as a whole so that they can win national championships. Right. And, and so that's an interesting, you know, uh, Lawrence and I talk about this a lot. You know, we, we talk to people in this business and, you know, we may skip over somebody or think about skipping over somebody be, that's on our team because we're trying to get to who they know. But, the, you know, that's a perfect example, Chuck. You never know what you're going to get out of somebody if you coach them properly you know, or show them that you have faith that they have what it takes to be successful, right? So, so don't discount those people on your team that today may not be doing a whole lot because tomorrow's a new day and, you know, tomorrow they may kick it up a notch and, you know, they may have extenuating circumstances in their life. It's all about timing. Maybe they can't, you know, focus on it today or the next six weeks or the next two months. But John Schwartz is a perfect example of that. I was just going to say. I knew I was going to bring that up. John, John Schwartz was, wasn't very active in this business. I think he went out and placed a scanner and then didn't really do a whole lot. And Lawrence and I talked to him, you know, two years ago and had a heart to heart with him. And now this guy's kicked it into high gear and you can't stop him. I mean, it's like he's like he's like what I imagine Lawrence was like 30 years ago before he ran out of steam and became really old. <laughs> <laughs> but um you know lawrence it would have been easy for lawrence to just say ah john swartz isn't doing much i'm just going to move on to the next guy but that's what's you know lawrence is really good at it. he's really good at going back to people that have scanners that aren't being productive and helping to make them productive or reps that you know maybe aren't taking this seriously and getting pulling the best out of them <laughs> so it's all about leadership style coaching learning from, from people in our past and, and using that in our futures, because those people have been successful. We wouldn't be, we wouldn't be learning from them, their leadership style, their coaching style, if they weren't successful, right? You surround yourself with success. And, you know, we, we, you know, it's just like we say in this business, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. You just need to work the system. Same thing with leadership, same thing with coaching, do what works, what other people have done in the past to be successful leading and coaching. So anybody have anything else? I know it's a little bit past 10 here. No other comments? Anybody? Don't be shy. Did you get Chuck on a whole segment? That was amazing. Good. Well, let's do that. Let's... Uh... Sorry, Chuck. <laughs> hey, hey, guys, I'm, I'm not that... I'm not that that kind of guy really i'm just a regular guy who uh just you know wants to help people out well that's what's that's what's uh inspiring about it that's the common denominator for everybody on this call yeah. um, you've developed brilliant skills you you've had the experience of of developing people and watching them come along i mean your story about keeping someone on the team when she was kind of mediocre but she got from you the you know, the, she got that captain, my captain moment from you and went on to, to greatness. And that's, that's a very powerful thing. And with experience like that, we can all learn from that. Agreed. I, I was just going to ask John if he could comment on from his perspective as what he thought kept him in the game and turned him around. <laughs> 
Yeah, so. <laughs> fear, uh, fear, like Chuck said, fear. <laughs> yeah, fear, Lawrence instilled fear in me. Um, no, I, um, yeah. Yeah, I mean it's 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 a it's a lot of different things. I've I always saw the value in this, um, but I had a lot of outside distractions, and so once I eliminated those distractions, I was able to turn the corner uh, because this was something that was had more value than any of the other things that I was working on, and so once I committed, then you know there was no turning back because I'm stubborn in a way. I want to you know, see something through and, and I don't want to do it just mediocre. I want to, I want to, you know, really put an effort into it. And so that's, that's what I did. And that's what I saw. So full-time effort yields full-time results. That's the best I, advice I can give. Yeah. I want to say something about Lawrence too. He saw something in me like Chuck did uh, that, that, uh, that one person he was speaking of, that, that I didn't see at the time. I'd never been in medical sales before. And he pushed me. And Lawrence is good at that in a very artful way. He, you know, he, he tells you what you need to do and inspires you. And, and that's, uh, that's the leadership that uh, has gotten me to where I am today in the business. I, you know, I see that, Mike. I'm glad you mentioned that because, you know, Chuck had mentioned that. And uh, it just seems like as leaders... We have to be. We have to have the strength of character to be able to push people when we see that's what's going to help them move forward. And we have a volunteer army. So many times, myself personally, you know, I try to be real kind and gentle, and you know, help motivate people. But you know, I guess there probably is a time there where you know you need to be uh, just open and honest and say, you know, hey, if, if you need to push harder if you want to get to where you've told me you want to get. You know. You know, one of the things that, you know, I'm most thankful for, for Lawrence is that he's given me my voice. You know, when we started doing these calls a year ago, year and a half ago now, something like that, you know, I went to Lawrence and I said, hey, I think we can make these, these Friday calls better. I think if we, you know, if we do these together, we could be much more effective and bring a lot more value. And, you know, it would have been easy for Lawrence to have an ego and say, nope, this is my gig. I'm doing it myself. Yeah, I've got a lot to say and, you know, I want people to hear it, and, you know you know, he didn't have to allow me to do these calls with them. And so, you know, it's really given me my, my voice and increased my personal growth and leadership and coaching skills and, and everything else. So I'm really thankful that, you know, Lawrence allows me to do these calls with them. It's been a phenomenal experience. I hope we bring value to you guys every single Friday. Um, they're not, they're not easy to prepare for, you know, there's a lot of thought that goes into it all week. You know, Lawrence and I will talk to each other several times a week and be like, what do you want to talk about this week? And sometimes it's difficult coming up with a topic. And sometimes we just talk about it for a little while and something pops up, you know, like we, we had no intention of talking to Chuck Gray this morning. It just kind of evolved into that as we started talking about leadership and it popped into my head, Hey, Chuck's a leader. You know, he's been a principal of a high school. He's been a coach, you know, that's a lead, that's a true leader, um, especially with kids, right? Adults are easier to coach than kids. Kids think they know everything. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so they're, you know, Lawrence and I say this all the time. I mean, I had, I have a brother that's, you know, I tried to get him on, on some of our products uh, about a year and a half ago. And he was, oh, I'm getting, yeah, blah, this is BS and blah, 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 blah. And he was listening to a podcast last week. And somebody said something about our food supply and we need to supplement this. And he calls me, he's like, Hey, have you ever heard about this? I'm like, dude, I told you this a year and a half ago. He's like, well, if you would have told me this a year and a half ago, I would have been on the supplements. You know, now I want to get on them. And I'm like, dude, okay. I told you, but whatever. If you get more out of a podcast than me, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> you know, sometimes they don't want to listen to us. So to Chuck's, to Chuck's, uh, you know, kids don't want to listen to us. So that's the, that's the most difficult coaching you can do. And, and and leadership so uh, you know my my hat's off to to chuck um, hey dan it, yeah. it sounds like you didn't do a three-way call with him i should have no i did actually with lawrence one day we, oh. didn't talk, we didn't really talk about the business it was just kind of an introduction but oh. uh, yeah i should have you, you're right i should, probably should have done a three-way call with him <laughs> <laughs> all right anybody any other comments yeah, I want to mention this. Um, you said you, you expressed the hope that you bring us uh, 
value every Friday. And I think uh, the proof of that value is it's now 12 minutes past 10 and there's still 13 participants right here listening and listening to you and watching what, what you and Lawrence are doing. And of course, what Chuck is doing as well. So um, you, you do bring value and it, this, these are great calls and they are thought provoking calls and that's perhaps the best value you can give. Awesome, thank you, Mark. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you guys. Thanks everybody for being on the call. Thanks for your participation, Chuck, Dan. Um, Jim, thanks, uh, John. Thanks, everybody. Michael, um, we appreciate you a lot, obviously. And it's about you, about us. It's about everybody. It's a team. And this is the whole point. We united, we united, we stand, divided, we fall. And this is how we've got to do it. We've got to all work and, and, and synchronize our, Mac, our, our thinking to be able to, to bring out the best in all of us. And quite frankly, I learn a hang of a lot every week because I talk a lot, but I listen a lot too. I ask a lot of questions and, and I try and listen and listen and listen. And, and then by going over things, we become better at it. I mean, I'm just so honored that Dan, you know, stepped up and he's, he's there like a rock. By the way, we've got some good news. Um, I'm going to just um, go a little bit. Dan had a... Um, a, a test yesterday, health test. He's got a clear bill of health after he had this big challenge a year and a half ago. Um, and he's got a clean bill of health. He's been given a new uh, degree of perfection. So good job, Dan. Thank God. Thanks, Lawrence. Thanks, everybody. Congrats, Dan. Thanks, man. Uh, that's a big monkey on your shoulders, on your back. Yeah, so it's good to get that off the back. So thanks, everybody. That's uh, awesome. thanks, thanks for being here. We really appreciate you. And uh, we look forward to seeing everybody next Friday. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, See you everybody. everybody. Good, good week. weekend. Thank you. Oh, congrats, Dan. Congrats. Hey, Happy for you, Dan. <laughs> thanks.